Hello, my name is Andy Gilman, and I'm the director of the Agora Foundation. In addition to our great book seminars and training for teachers, our Ojai Chautauqua project promotes civil discourse on complicated subjects. And we are focusing in 2023 on a series of videos with community leaders and most specifically our city council members to try to dig into issues more deeply that affect our valley. On April 14th, Tom Kraus, our board president, and I met with Leslie Rule talking about affordable housing in Ojai. And we get into some very specific issues around state mandates, what the city is doing, some of the controversy, and some of the differing opinions. We hope you enjoy this, and this will be the first. We hope to interview every city council person on some specific issue and look forward to that uh, in the summer and the fall. Thank you very much. Let us know if you have any questions. Leslie, welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me. We're so pleased that you're here um, to talk about the housing issue in our valley. Tom's going to kick it off. So I wonder if you could give us a big picture, just a big picture view of, you know, why, why is this important? How important is it? How, how much is lacking? And, you know, what are the obstacles? Just, just a big picture view of the landscape. Okay, so a big picture view of the landscape would start with um, how many households we have in Ojai. So we have 3,481 households in Ojai. Um, and so, and of those, senior-headed households are about a third of those. Senior-headed meaning? Meaning people who um, are over the age of 65 and ostensibly retired. Old people. Old people, <laughs> yes. Um, of those, 78% uh, are single-family dwellings. Okay, so of our 3,481, 78% are single-family dwellings. Okay, which means it has various ramifications that we can go into, a single family versus a multifamily. Um, different laws apply, different kinds of rules and regulations apply. So we can talk about that. Um, so that would mean 21% are multi-units. Okay, so um, if you look at that and you take the number of seniors that are heading these households, which are 1,200, Okay, um, and you look at the number of households that we have, seniors eventually are going to move out of their homes, which means that they are going to sell them. When you, give, when you look at the median price of our single family households, and I will say, and this is just a caveat, um, that we don't have data that is post-COVID. And we do know that the world changed around housing yeah. during COVID. So the last numbers that we have are from 2020, but they're the last numbers that we have. Sure, okay. So we can, in understanding what's happened in our community, extrapolate you know, how we might adjust that. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're finding is, is that as seniors sell their homes, new people come in let's just say, and this is not far off, that the median income is, at this point, a million dollars, because it's a nice round number and it's not that far off. There's the median only, income of the people moving here? No, I'm sorry, oh, the, 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 housing the, 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 the housing price. Okay, yeah. it, so, sorry, That's the good. housing price is yeah. about a million dollars yeah. for even starter homes mm -hmm. um, you know, that have some cosmetic uh, improvements, not mm -hmm. necessarily any structural improvements. So when you see that, um, you know that you're going to be bringing in a certain kind economic, socio, socioeconomic um, person, who, family, who can afford that. So that's the first thing. So the demographic trend favors higher priced housing in Ohio. Oh, absolutely. Yes, or, yes. And yeah. then the It's other hard to know what's causing what. In other words, the housing prices... The, you're, you said the demographic trend is causing the housing prices, but it could be, you could argue the opposite way, right? In other words, the housing prices are necessitating who can buy them and move here. Well, I just meant the fact oh. that seniors are a significant portion and that they're going to be the ones oh, selling. That's the, yes. That's Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. And keep in mind, and this number fluctuates, we don't really know how many homes have been sold, 
but renters for single-family dwellings is 58% of the population of single-family homes are, okay. are renters are housing it. So okay. 58% of that particular number are at risk. Mm-hmm. That house gets sold, they have to move on, and there's really no way around that. Mm-hmm. Um, they, people can buy those homes to become owner-occupied, or they can buy those homes to become rentals that they will then move into at their retirement, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and that's why you see, for instance, when a single-family home is sold, all of a sudden the cost of it is seven thousand dollars a month. Right. That's because there's a new re- there's a new assessment. They've paid this particular amount of money for it. The mortgage is this. The yeah. taxes are this. Yeah. Um, all of these yeah. expenses are not based on a home that was bought 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay, so therein lies yeah. the issue. The, um, the mechanism by which rent is increasing. Correct. Yeah. Do for, we know? Yeah. Maybe you don't know, or, or maybe nobody knows exactly. But how many homes are purchased that turn into just income properties for for those purchasers? We do not know. Okay. Okay. Um, we do not know. There are. We can find out the vacancy rate. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that would be second home purchasers. Okay, and they come up for four months out of the year. They may then rent it for six or eight months out of the year, or they may not. Okay. Um, so we we don't actually know it, it. As far as investment goes, a single family home in Ojai is not a good investment. It's just too darn expensive right now, right? Even if someone can pay seven thousand dollars a month, you could put your million dollar investment somewhere else and get a much better return with a lot less energy. Okay. Um, because while they believe that investment in real estate is a passive endeavor, you get that phone call at 2 a.m. that the plumbing's broken. So mm-hmm. that becomes a question as well. And so this is the one of the root causes of the difficulty of people who have fixed low income or just low income finding suitable housing in, in Ojai. Correct. And... Um, then we have the um, debate, the civic debate, over whether or not um, we want to approve low-income housing. Um, and that has taken form with the Becker Agreement, and it has also taken form, although not actively yet, with Cabrillo Vistas, which is right your neighbor. So now is it right that we, the community is pretty much in agreement that this is a good thing to do in general, that is having low-income housing yes. is a good development. Uh, yes. no, nobody would say, no, we shouldn't do that. We're to, to hell with them. You know, um, let, let it gentrify, no problem. No right. one would have that view. It's the how that is the problem. That the how it? is the problem. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Um, I think that philosophical answer is one thing and actual answer is something else, <laughs> and, and hence lives the term NIMBYism. So yes. there are some people, but that's a minor, very pretty small minority I don't of people think so. in Ohio. You, no? you, you think it's a large percentage? I, I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a larger percentage, and it's people who are influential in the Valley who would, in other words, they would like people to be able to live here, but if you said, does that, does that necessitate building something that they would come here, the answer would be they don't want that. Right. And that and that's for on on the grounds that it's um, not our job as people in the community to to provide that. It's an economic system, it's a free market. Let it run. Is that the idea, or why would they? No, object? the idea is is that we love our small town the way it is, and we don't want to bring in um, any more people. Um, we don't want to increase density. Um, and that's not something that is specific to Ojai. That is California writ large. And so that would bring us to all of the laws and regulations that have come off out of the legislature and off the governor's desk to stop that because there are, there are things that you use to stop building. Um, and they are built in systemically to... 
um, city councils and into planning commissions. Mm -hmm. Now, just for clarity, the government, the state government's position on this is favorable to low-income housing. Can we can we talk about that specifically? Yes. So, what what is the state mandates that they're asking of municipalities? Um, so, the state has a number of units that you were required to build. Those are your RENA numbers, regional housing assessment numbers, number assessment. So those are your numbers that the, the state gives to the county and then the county breaks up to all of the municipalities within that county. So the state says you have to, you have to identify parcels where this could be built. That's your first step. Mm -hmm. And then if you have any sort of um, impediments to that, you must get rid of them. So there is a law called SB 35. Basically, you're allowed to build affordable housing under certain conditions ministerially, which means that the city has no control over what you are building outside of the existing regulations. So only objective regulations, one of them would be ha you know, height, one of them would be setback, one mm -hmm. of them would be parking requirements. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I ask you, let me just yeah, clarify, please. okay, or ask for clarification. So if there was a project that fell within all of those requirements, then even if the city council voted against it, it would still go through? The city council will not have an option to vote against okay. it. it. The planning commission must stamp okay. it. That's the, okay. And their objective oh. um, criteria. So okay. the planning commission can't say, well, it doesn't look this way. You okay. know, a look this way is not an objective criteria. A okay. height is mm -hmm. an objective criteria. Mm -hmm. A parking requirement, a setback is an okay. objective criteria. So there is a fundamental difference of view about the desirability of having additional uh, low-cost housing. Mm -hmm. And one of the views is uh, change. Uh, we, don't, we want Ojai to stay like it is. We don't want to have changes. And if we have all this low-cost housing, that's a change that's right. undesirable. Correct. Um, yes, that is correct. Um, and, and then it becomes this larger question around... Um, smart growth. So if you build, for instance, the Cabrillo Vistas, you get, um, and, and we can talk also about, I want to go back to the to the laws because they're mm -hmm. even, and, and, and OHI is now, is now part of this, there are even more stricter laws that have come in. And so for both the Becker Agreement and Cabrillo, Cabrillo Vistas, they have now applied for something known as Builder's Remedy, which is even more allowance okay. and less power than the than the city government has because mm -hmm. it's it a little complicated mm -hmm. the state requires this thing called a housing element that lays all of this out ours is 140 pages mm -hmm. um, you have you have to turn this in every you know and and it has to be approved it has to be compliant mm -hmm. so it has to do all these things that the housing and community development department of the state requires you to do if it is not so there's a due date and if it is not deemed substantially compliant with 120 days of that due date then there is something called a builder's remedy that can be filed both Cabrillo Vista Cabrillo Vista and the Becker agreement have both filed builder's remedies because we are not substantially compliant. Okay. And that is something that we knew was a possibility and we talked about it. So while... We, that, the council. The, the council and the city and, and okay. you know, and the community development department, we all mm -hmm. knew that this was a risk. So for instance, mm -hmm. um, the Becker Agreement now, Builder's Remedy, they are... If it goes to the public and the public says no, they actually are freed from an agreement that is more detrimental now to them. So if I were them, I would do nothing. Right. And I would let the people who don't want it to happen 
go wild. Can you let can you let us know? Or I know not everybody who watches this will know what is the current state of the the Becker Group agreement. Is it's going to go to a vote? It's going to go to a vote in March. Okay. A, and, a vote of the city council? No, no a vote the of the public. Okay. So basically, it was approved by the city council. Last time. Last time. Uh, by a the majority? Previous, by a unanimous vote? The previous council was 4-1. This council was 3-2 to approve it. So, um, and, and where, also, where were you in the 3-2? I was on the vote to approve. Yeah, okay. And, and they had been working with them for years. For years and years. Okay. And the reason is, I mean, I'm not going to say whether, I, you know, people have accused me of being pro-development. If we had rescinded the agreement that the previous council had agreed to and with some things that had occurred that council members had done, we would have been sued for, a, I think, minimally a quarter of a million dollars, we would have been responsible for attorney's fees. So because it had been approved by two councils, I, you know, or one council, I saw no option here. Mm -hmm. um, it was also going to give us 25 deed-restricted affordable housing units. Over four properties. Over right? four properties. Mm -hmm. And various tenant protections that they were not required to do, which a builder's remedy will take all of that away. Mm -hmm. So, so, the, the, so this council, the current council, decided to vote no and to put it to the the voters to approve it. Or to no, the that. current council okay. voted to go on to go forward with the agreement. Okay. At which time, a nonprofit had collected enough signatures to say it goes to ballot. Okay. Right. So it was a it was a public's initiative to put it to ballot. The council had had. And the nonprofit that did that. That was simply Ohio. Okay, and that's that's. A, a group that the mayor is involved with. Correct. Okay. And is, yes, and it's, yes, and, and I will leave it at that. Um, people, that is not news to anyone who's... So, so I, I, I'm hoping I'm being clear on this and walking I you through so, it I think so, but let me, let me yeah, say please. it back and be sure I've got it right. Please. So the Becker group made this proposal. The previous city council said yes. The current city council said yes, three to two. A nonprofit group, which the mayor is associated with, I mention that because I think it's relevant, um, got an initiative, got it on the ballot. Correct. And it, that's where it stands now. So Correct. The, the people will vote. Correct. Yes or no. Correct. That is, those people who are allowed to vote in Ohio. Correct. And that will be in November? That will be in March. In March, okay. Okay. So that so a that's a special where, election in March. Uh, yes, but we it's a primary as well. So oh, yes, um, right. we okay. we compromised. Had we not a special election in Ohio costs about eighty five thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. If we tag it on to um, an already existing election, okay. I can't remember if that's eighteen thousand or mm -hmm. you know something. It's something in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a better idea to do it that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Are you seeing people put money and energy into a campaign leading up to March to try to do something? I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Okay. Um, there was thought that there would be, you know, there would be this this battle, but I think um, I don't know what's going to happen because of the builder's remedy. As I said, okay. you know, uh, that changes that changes things. Um, so can I there, just to backtrack a tiny bit? Yeah. I to me. It, it seems, or I'm asking this question, part of the housing issue is, yes, the home sales, as we talked about. I thought the other part of the equation, or at least part of the difficulty, is we have this population of people driving into Ojai for work and leaving Ojai to go home. Yes. And that's a, that's a pretty big number. I think the Economic Development Council estimated something like 4,000 people a day are coming in and out. Now, I can verify that. but. Right. Um, so when people talk about traffic in mm -hmm, Ohio mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. challenge, yeah. yes, there is more traffic on the weekends, but part of this is people working. Yes, okay. yes. So 82% um, of workers who live in Ohio commute out. 83% mm -hmm. of workers who work in Ohio commute in. That's just that, ponder that. That's so, incredible. To me. Uh, workers in general, people employed. Yes, workers, so the people who work in Ohio, 83% of them commute in. Right. 
the workers, people who live in Ojai that work commute out. Commute out. <laughs> because there, are the, there aren't the jobs here for them to afford to live here, so they work somewhere else. There aren't the okay. jobs. There aren't. There isn't the housing. So, um, so that, so so that brings us to the idea of smart growth. Okay. So, for instance, the Cabrillo Vistas. They are fully electric. They have gray water and water capture, permeable sur sur surfaces, uh, solar, and a three-day battery. You saw the renderings, which I right. sent to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you talk now, and you, when you look at Ojai's housing stock and how old it is, then you, and, and they have fire hardening because it's required. Um, you know, they have water. Uh, uh, you know all the devices that they need to for low low use water so that in some ways can be considered smart growth it would also potentially take however many of those people are commuting in and commuting out especially workers and that gets us into what is workforce housing mm -hmm. um, and that's yet another category um, we have uh, I think it's 40 percent mm -hmm. of our work for people that work in Ojai work in education. 40 mm -hmm. percent? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of people who I, work I, in Ojai are I have working that number. on okay. educationally yeah. related jobs? I, I do jobs? have that number, yes. I would, well, I, education as a, as a group would I think would be the second largest employer. Yes. Does that sound right? No, well, it might that, be 29. I have, to, I have to find the figure. You're going to have to okay. get that out. That's okay. That's yeah. both public and private education? Yeah, it's education. And the other, then again, is leisure. But it's so, education broadly? To how broadly defined? Is I it? think you work for an educational institution. So Agora it could be broad. would, would it could be, be an educational broad. institution? I think it has to do with how you categorize yourself on your tax returns. Yeah. So if you I categorize yourself as a right. uh, under that category, so it's mostly going to be then public schools and private schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Um, Not so much foundations, but that's right. a huge proportion it's of a the huge population. Proportion. It might be twenty nine. You're going to have to check on this, okay? Because I have those figures. The other one is leisure, and leisure is slightly higher than education, mm -hmm. and everybody else is everything else is nothing. But that would include all the hotels, all, all the their hotels, employees, correct? Which correct. Is, is gigantic. And, so, and those are obviously, you know, it's called leisure, but the vast majority of them are service workers to so the extent that they are. When we did our tourism panel in 2017, we looked at employment data at that time, what we, the latest we could find. All the managerial or professional jobs were declining and all the service industry or leisure jobs were increasing. So we just saw that as a trend to also try to explain why do we have this declining public school enrollment as a factor. So just jobs being here. Right. Okay. So then that's part of the smart growth mm -hmm. policy. So, um, for instance, uh, Cabrillo Vista is estimating 75 kids because this is family housing. That would put 75 kids into our school district. When you look at the numbers of seniors in housing, one thing seniors don't have is school-aged kids, right. unless they have their kids in who might have school-aged kids, but that's a whole different kind of story. Um, so, you know, the smart growth has to do with, you know, traffic, which has to do with, you know, air pollution and carbon, you know, burning of fossil fuels and all of that. So when you look at something called smart growth and you look at these other factors that you can potentially mitigate by doing smart growth, right? And, you know, the growth in Ojai, really, it has to be infill. Smart growth means growth that uh, brings with it other desirable attributes. Correct. Civically, civic, you know, things that, that civically would improve the you know, the, the resource management or whatever it happens Or that to it's, be. I would say, doesn't it also mean that it's planned? In other words, it's, we're not simply going to say, well, whatever the market forces want to do, we're going to do. We're, we want to influence that in some ways with right. with governmental policy, for example. Right, well, the market forces aren't going to build in Ohio. Right. It just, it doesn't, as they say, pencil out. Got it. The only people who are going to build in Ojai are going to build, They're going to, it's going to be infill building ADUs, okay. um, you know, which are a way for, for single-family homes to augment income, 
um, or assisted living. It just, it, 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 I, I mean, it's not that you can't. Mm -hmm. It's just that you, you can't do it in any way that makes financial sense. Okay. So how, uh, how important is this in, in terms of the big picture in Ojai? In other words, there are, you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of things that people in Ojai generally think are important. There's education mm -hmm. that appears to need a lot of assistance mm -hmm. at this time. Uh, there is the problem of having good jobs mm -hmm. uh, that are available to people. There's an environmental mm -hmm. uh, issue that's big and complex. Uh, there's a sense of how much of a vibrant community is this where people are engaged and involved. You know, mm -hmm. all politics is local politics. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a part of this. I, of course, I happen to live in the East End, so I can't vote. Mm -hmm. It's another subject we might want to talk about sometime. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but, but in that big configuration, mm -hmm. where does this stack up? I mean, is this one of the top two or three things that should be addressed? Well, I think it is because it affects all those other things, right? If you don't have housing, you have people commuting in and commuting out. Within the top three, this issue. Oh, yeah. This I is up. Yeah, what else? I, I, I try to think of the big things, and I'm well, like... Well, education would be <clears throat> the top of my list. If you don't have housing, I mean, we don't have kids. We have 50% less kids in Nordoff than we did 10 years ago. Yeah. Yep. And we get our funding, the state funds, based on average daily attendance. Right. We don't have kids. We don't have average daily attendance. Yet you still need to pay the same amount for the most part, for grounds mm -hmm. and for, you know, buildings and for teachers. And so all of the infrastructure stuff, yep. you're still paying the same amount, but you're not getting the same amount. So the schools, I see a direct correlation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If families can't move here, we can't put kids in school. Mm -hmm. well, can I, when you say yeah. that they're connected, it seems to me, here's the way that I've tried to think about it is, if we want to say a diverse, vibrant economy is something that would be something we'd all care about for our future, this housing issue is part of that issue, too. They're connected to each other, that people can live here, afford to live here, that there are jobs here, not just leisure jobs. So that's part of the issue, too. And then, obviously, water. So I, I put it definitely in my top four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're all connected to each other. They're all connected yeah. to each other, yes, because one of the only ways, actually, that you can get around um, building affordable housing is either through not being able to get your water allocation or your will serve mm -hmm. um, and also uh, you know if it's extreme fire uh, yeah. hazard right? yeah. if you live in an extreme fire hazard uh, area then those are the two that um, could okay. conceivably stop an affordable housing uh, project that was um, compliant in all other ways I see. can I let so going back to this Cabrillo Vista project mm -hmm. what do you imagine public arguments would be against the project. Let's say it was completely compliant, but then people wanted to voice their opinions about why it shouldn't be built. Do you have any sense of what people would say against the project? Um, I have heard that everything is great, but what's the building materials it's made out of? That, to me, is just kind of a red herring. But um, I th why, why is that being asked? Because of environmental considerations? Yeah, Not because hard. everything else isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. You know, your building materials are also have to be considered here. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I would say, you know, parking. Um, is there enough parking? Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, do you really want 50 more cars on Main Street? That's going to be the big one. Do you really want 50 more cars on Main Street? Now, but so part of big. that equation is going to be they're already on Main Street now. I mean, depending on how many yeah. people who live and work here now live there. Right. Or don't live here. Right. Which is, here's here's a fabulous new law um, that, you know, funny thing is, with city council, we can't ask um, any city departments to research anything for us unless we get a council majority vote. Okay. So I can't call up someone, you know, someone in planning, for instance, and say, can you research this law for me to see how it would affect housing? I actually have to have the city council vote to have staff time be used for this. But there is a new law that came out in September 2022 that allows cities to prioritize at risk exist at risk for displacement 
for tenants displacement can be prioritized for affordable housing if it was uh, subsidized by the state, which of course this project is. So we can actually, and, and I have asked the research that I've done, I'm not a lawyer, I can read it and I can say, well, this is, I think, what this is saying, you know, but then I need planning and a lawyer to actually look at it. But if it is deed restricted, affordable housing funded by the state, there is a law that came out in September of 2022 that says that a city can prioritize existing at risk tenants for those units. So a big thing is we don't want 50 new people moving into Ojai that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and basically, you know, you can't discriminate. You haven't been able to discriminate, say, a long-term tenant, as well as all of the other protected classes that there are. Um, but this particular law says that you can prioritize okay. at-risk existing tenants. And that would be somebody whose house is going to be sold, that would have to leave, okay, that they're renting. Exactly. Okay. That would be renters. They would get priority okay. to these units. So I'm not, sorry, I didn't understand something you said. You, I think you just said we don't want people moving into our that we don't know. That's the biggest argument against. And against. What, what does that mean? You mean only that our means, friends can move to Ohio? That means they that. Have, we have criteria for who can be a pretty citizen? Much. Yeah. We want, we want, well, no, not our friends, our, our existing well, residents. Right? Is, is, is anything that we're doing going to help them, or are we just going to increase Ojai's population and the number of cars that are on the road? So that's the real. That's the real argument. You're saying that, that you're not arguing. That's what you are believing. That's our, that you're saying what people would argue. That for. is the main okay. argument. I see. Like it doesn't do any any good for the town of Ojai to have just willy nilly people moving in. Yeah, to have 50 with, uh, more people here, even though it does various things, puts kids in school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just 50 more people in Ojai. Well, it's interesting, though, that, that the school argument, which is not the primary subject for today, if we said 50 kids will be, or 75 kids will be put into OUSD, those are new, those would be new families. Those would be new, yeah. and that, that's okay. quite a chunk of change, actually. No, of course it is. It's um, times 20,000 or something yeah, like it's, that. Yeah, it's, it's a chunk of change. But, so... When you think about that, then you see it's a double-edged sword because our population, especially the renters, they're, they're elderly. You know what I mean? I mean, they're not going to bring kids in. So that argument that we can actually enliven the city by bringing some, okay. some young, active yeah. energy, you know, rec department parks, yeah. you know, that kind of thing happening. Well, here's to me is an ideal situation. and. I'm not meaning to be naive, but no. if there were somebody that is working here already but lives outside of the valley somewhere and they're commuting every day, they become move they move into this place and now their kids instead of going to Ventura Unified or Oxnard Unified now come to Ojai Unified and they don't have to commute. That correct. would be ideal. So they they already belong here. They're already here. They're already here, correct. Yeah. That okay. is absolutely correct. Okay. Um and I'm, I think that what that is, and is a whole nother discussion, is workforce housing. Mm -hmm. So um, the discussion, and, and the state has, has you know, made and, and passed a number of laws that have made workforce housing easier to build. Okay. Um, so that would be workforce housing. Well, what's workforce housing? It's housing for your workforce. So for instance, you know, teachers can't afford to live here. So you can take vacant OUSD property and convert it into housing. Oh, housing that, appropriate to the yeah. people who are going to work here. Correct. Well, we that, want to have work. Well, that's being discussed too. Yeah, workforce housing generally means that, you know, the school district will work with a builder for the school district's people. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't generally cross sectors. Mm -hmm. So you don't have this catch-all phrase ca called workforce housing where you have leisure workers and teachers. That would be an affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Workforce housing um, is the particular sector. But the employer is significantly involved, if not wholly, driving the whole project, right? Or no? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yes. 
Absolutely. The, uh, and it, it's happening a lot in education. Well, and the Lehman Era project on the 126, I thought, was an example of that, if I recall that correctly. In other words, that's workforce housing that they were a part of. Is that right? I could cut that. I, I don't know. I, have to I, wish, I, I wish I could okay. answer no, that. No, no problem. No, no, that's good. Can I ask about, I don't, just another, yeah, you mentioned the ADUs, mm -hmm. and the ADUs have loosened up in their requirements, I think, over the past few years, what can be built? Correct. Okay. And right now we're living with a minimum of a 30-day rental. Correct. Short-term rental. And that's trying to counteract the Airbnb sort of Correct. phenomenon. Correct. How is that working out, would you say? Um, I think you get different... You know, it really depends on who you're talking to, and no one is really tracking it. People are tracking um, uh, violations of that. Mm -hmm. Like if someone, your neighbor, can drop a dime on you because they see that, you know, actually in this month you had two different groups come in. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no enforcement. There's, there's an enforcement mechanism. There's no... Um, uh, there's no mechanism by which to find out who's doing who unless your neighbor calls it in. Okay. So that and that's standard requirement in many many cities. No, they I, require. I know, so they require. They re, they rely upon the public to give them the information, and then they can enforce with a letter, and then they right. you know then they do other things. Well, I'm asking about that for a couple reasons. One was again in 2017, we were trying to respond through the tourism panel looking at the short-term rentals that had just basically stopped right then. Mm -hmm. And the argument at the time, I thought, was if we don't have short-term rentals now, then there will be more housing available for people to live here. That, that was an argument at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that's materialized. But So people are using the ADUs to both make it affordable for them to live here, to mm -hmm. buy a place and build that, but then also, I thought, it's for families maybe who could then rent out the, the guest place or something mm -hmm. like that for a more affordable rate. So I, I guess I, that was promoted as a solution to our problem, but mm -hmm. I don't, it doesn't seem like it's materialized quite that way. Or it's part of the solution? Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's part of the solution. So if you look at Ojai's, um, you know, the building is going to be infill, so already existing within city limits. That's called infill. We're not going to take... Um, you know, uh, public lands that are that are that are already not built on. So someone builds an ADU in their backyard. There's various things they can do with it. Um, you know, they can move. It can be an intergenerational. They can move their family. Maybe their kid comes back from college. Maybe you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever. So it becomes intergenerational family housing. Right. It can become a rental unit so that um, you know uh, income is augmented. Because, um, you know, a lot of the old timers, you know, they, they are not wealthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're home wealthy. They now have a home that's worth a million dollars. And that brings up its own kind of, you know, should I sell now? You know, I mean, should, I never thought I would have an asset that was worth a million dollars. You know, I have been concerned about my retirement my whole life. Um, if I sell now, you know, set. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's kind of the gift, you know, each generation gets some kind of gift, you know, whether it's medical their whole life or, you know, pensions or whatever. Well, this is a final kind of gift. And, you know, that is a mechanism by which, you know, the houses sell and, um, and they especially sell if, if the people don't live in them. Right. And that's where the renters get, get booted out. But point being with, with ADUs, um, you know, there's various uses for them. Um, they, and they can also be short-term rentals mm -hmm. for over 30 days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can rent them for 30 days, you know, 12 times a year. And I'm still within, you know, I'm still legally mm -hmm. uh, safe. Right. So, you know, what people do with them is sort of open once they're built. But they're not cheap to build, right. um, even if you do have approved plans. Um, you know, cost of building in, Cal in California and certainly in this area is, is very, very high. So generally you would have, you know, most people don't have that kind of cash hanging around. So they have to take a, you know, home equity loan or, you know, refinance or whatever it is that they need to do in order to do that. So I don't believe it has really affected housing stock in one way or another, 
Um, but it is, we are building 15 a year, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know what strikes me as, a, as an organizational <clears throat> person, someone who studies organizations for a living, what I do? Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that this is a really complex question that requires high-functioning governance. Right. High-functioning. And, and it, doesn't, it seems like we're on the other end of that spectrum right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's so complex, and the state has... Because we haven't built, and because we have this huge housing deficiency in California, the state has come in with an incredible amount of regulations that require, you know, adherence because there are penalties to it. They have put in place regulatory bodies and who are active. You know, some regulatory bodies are not so active. You know, they're not really they're not really following up. This the housing and community development. They were they were put in place to make sure that this happens. And so for instance, I think our budget on litigation is going to increase five times, ten times. Because of, right. because of what's and happening right now. And that's all waste. And that's all waste. I mean, and there's you no, can't no stop There's no mechanism it. operating there nope. except some sense of justice, I suppose. Or somebody who wants to stop something and they right. have a friend who's a lawyer who can write mm -hmm. it up. So we can make Anybody a can it. sue anybody. And so I foresee that's why the state has come in and taken the power away from the city. So if you are a city that wants to do this, you have the state kind of behind you saying, you know, you have to approve this. So it's giving cover to cities who want to do it. And then for cities who don't want to do it, it's forcing them to do it. So we can't be alone in that boat, right? With that oh, kind of no. Reality. Huntington right. Beach has yeah. said, we're not listening to the state at all. Now the state's suing them. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the Huntington Beach is, you're not the boss of us. <laughs> you know, so, but the state has, you know, the, they have the oomph to actually, yeah. you know, sue and, and force because the state gives you money and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. The state has power and um, and the feds behind this as well in their so own what, way. So what would help with getting better governance? Getting, I mean, the city council meetings that I've watched or attended are uh, pretty pathetic. There's to nothing. Be blunt about it. I mean, There's I'm, nothing. Other than being entertaining at times. Yeah, I know. There's uh, nothing. I don't, I don't see a way through it. Honestly, until election time. Until possibly. election time. Well, I don't what see about an election time? So we 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 tried to help a little bit and contribute a little bit by having a the forum, forum yeah. where mm -hmm. all of the. But I don't know that that I didn't feel like I learned much of anything about anybody it's, in well, that it's, forum. It, it's so short. Everyone said the same thing. Everyone yeah. said the same they thing. They had Everyone. their list of five things yeah. and exactly. they outlined their right. list, and so I. I got a sense of who was a good public speaker yeah. Yeah. to vote for. You have to have a debate. Uh -huh. You have to have people going, asking each other questions and following up on that or having a moderator mm -hmm. who then follows up, you know, who can see what three steps down the road for that particular, uh -huh. you know, uh, response was or let me follow up with that. Does this mean... Wasn't um, there a debate, at least for the mayors? That, not, not that we did. Oh, I thought there was something on the radio or something. But. Um, it, it was a forum. Okay. It was a forum. It was the um, uh, uh, women League of Women Voters. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. And we did that too, and it was a forum. Could you yeah. answer this question? No, I, yeah. I'll I, answer it. I saw some of that. So maybe what we could do is district by district have a real debate. And so we're going to do not just one event, <laughs> but right. a more detailed event that's an hour long with just two or three people. Right. And mm -hmm. once again, you know, uh, um, Candidates are free to decline that, as mm -hmm. did happen mm -hmm. in this last election. The Democratic Club didn't have all the all the people. Well, they there. had a forum, the but um, there was calls for a mayoral debate, and mm -hmm. uh, one candidate just simply refused. Right, right. No, I saw that. So then there's that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I think that's the only way. But but, and I'm not. I can talk about elections, but you have once again. You get the government that you vote for. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to delve deeply or don't care, and there's a whole big issue around that about how we make it hard for people to care, mm -hmm. you know, um, and life is very busy, 
And when you prioritize, you don't prioritize trying to weed through mm-hmm. all of the stuff that candidates will tell you. Or to spend four or five hours on a Tuesday night yeah. at a council meeting, is it's that's challenging. I mean, thank you for doing it. No, it is. It, it's it, incredibly yeah. challenging. Yeah. Um, and so until you have a populace that feels like they are empowered, mm-hmm. um, and once again, that's demographics, mm-hmm. that's education levels, that's... You know, people who have to get up at six o'clock to go to work are less, are much less inclined to have the time or energy to do that than people who, you know, either work in very fluid jobs or don't work at all. Um, and so, those concerns of, uh, you know, certain demographics are either, um, you know, addressed or not. And so, once again, you you look at this question. Um, there are small communities in California that have done a better job of this. Better. I mean, they're not. It's not like unheard of. <laughs> no, I Carpinteria is great. Uh-huh. Golita is great. Uh-huh. They engage. They have open sessions mm-hmm. that invite the public. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're in in the process of putting together. A, you know, we had this whole brouhaha, well, I would call it more than a brouhaha, actually, about, you know, um, Brown Act violations right. and, you know, duplicitous actions and breaking yeah. confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera. And we have promised the public that we would have a workshop and disclose all of this. But what has been um, offered is we will have someone come in who will tell us how to move forward but we won't relitigate the past. When we have, in fact, said to the public that we will disclose all the things that have happened. We, we the council, we the, the city council, council have said that? We, the city council, have said that. But once again, you know, it's a, how many, you need three votes on the city council, mm-hmm. right? So it, things get, you know, things, yeah. Well, the way it appears to me is that having disparate points of view about this, this vision for housing just on this particular point, that's a good thing, and that you would every, the sides would come together and find some kind of a compromise to make that work. That sounds like that's the way the system should work. Mm-hmm. But the way it seems from an outsider's perspective is, is extremities still are having a very loud voice and, and not ready to compromise but stopping what, what can be stopped. So... That's how it looks to me, though, is that compromise is hard to reach. Compromise is hard to reach, yes. Um, And even though we make steps towards each other, Mm -hmm. something happens and boom. Okay. We're we're back apart as Mm -hmm. far as we ever were, right? There's no trust. There's absolutely no trust. And when you have no trust, then it's impossible to compromise because you don't don't believe in it. So for this housing... um, for these housing projects, um, you know, there was a group who thought that getting 25 deed-restricted, low-income housing that had never, we have no deed-restricted housing here in Ohio, was a really good thing, mm-hmm. and that we should make some accommodations in order to get that, especially given the fact of all the history about this. Mm-hmm. Yet, that was not anything that, that could be seen as a compromise. Yeah. You know, um, maybe Cabrillo Vistas, Cabrillo Vistas, when they when they um, they have put in an application for a builder's remedy, so um, maybe when that comes up. Um, but you know, even anybody can sue anybody. So even though the city can't do anything, the city can still be sued for not doing anything. Right. Now, just that's the same company that is building the project that's in Maramani. Correct. Is that right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and um, they built two others I can look and see in Ohio. Okay. So, um, and then the uh, Ventura County Housing Authority has a couple, and that's the Section 8 housing. Okay. Um, so I think we have, uh, I want to say roughly 200 um, uh, affordable housing. In the valley? In Ohio. Oh, 200 units of affordable oh, housing, no, right. and 100 of them are Whispering Oaks. Right. 101 yes. is, are Whispering Oaks, and 25 right. is okay. 
Sycamore and eight is here and nine is there. But they yeah. it's been 30 years, you know, mm -hmm. um, since anything's been okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>